So a couple of months ago, I did a very long and thorough review of the 2012 Fisker Karma. And overall, I gave the car a B plus rating, said it was very good you know, when it worked. And I had a beef with the infotainment system in this car. I gave it an F minus and I said it was so horrible, it deserved a review all to its own. And so that's what I'm going to finish today. Now it's been about two months since then and the reason that it took me so long to get around to doing this review is that I was waiting for a big software update that Fisker had told us about and it was supposedly going to fix a lot of the car's woes. So I wanted to be fair to Fisker and give them the chance to get the uh, 615 update out, get it installed in this car and give myself time to uh, play around with that update to make sure everything was cool. Well. The good news is, is that yes, they did fix a lot of the fundamental software problems in the car, um, things with the dashboard locking up and uh, system crashes on the nav system and all over the place. But unfortunately, there are still tons of problems with the command center. Um, I'm going to be blunt, start off by just saying I still give it an F, I'm not going to give it an F minus anymore because at least it doesn't crash quite as often, but it's still does do graphics corruption and it loses settings and it's still awful. So let's get started. Okay, so the power's up. It usually takes a little while, sometimes a long while. Waiting, waiting. Now I should point out that what happens most of the time is as soon as you turn the car on, the AC is just blasting you. And in the winter, it's blowing frigid, freezing air in your face. So it's 35 degrees in your garage. It's blowing 35 degree air right at you, full blast, because the heater was on when you turn the car off. But this computer, this command center computer at least, is too stupid to realize that it's freezing out and that it shouldn't blow frozen air at your face when you have no way of turning it off until this thing finishes booting. Not only does it have to finish booting, but then you have to hit agree before you can even get into the command center. Notice how long that took. And then finally, here we are at the climate control screen where we could then turn it off. Now, even in the summer, or I shouldn't say summer, but spring, because that's what it is right now, it's fairly warm outside. You know, in the mornings, it'll be cool in here, and I still get blasted with this cold air. It's really frustrating, and this is one of the problems of having everything on a computer screen. You know, once again, some things should just be analog controls. I want to be able to get my car and immediately turn the AC off so I don't get frozen out. Anyhow, let's start talking about the command center here. So one of the things that I think that they did a pretty decent job of actually, you know, is this hierarchical menu system. You know, it was a good idea in practice. On the left, you have, uh, you know, your basic five functions. So you have climate control, audio, phone, navigation, and system. Now you may notice on system there's a little problem. You can't read it. Can you actually see that it says system underneath that icon? Nope, you can't because the color scheme in the command center is awful. I really don't know what they were thinking. It's, and I've said this before, it's gray on gray, it's white on white, black on black, whatever. It's a horrible low contrast color scheme and during the day the glare on here is absolutely awful, and you just can't see anything, especially anything in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. That just, you know, geometrically, that's kind of where all the glare comes from. That's where the brightest hot spot is. And, you know, in the upper right-hand corner, we have the date and the time. Well, uh, first of all, the clock is this itty-bitty little font, and it's white on light gray. So even, even in here, under controlled lighting, uh, you know, situations, it's still really hard to see. I mean, you can't read the clock at all when you're driving the car during the day. It's impossible. You can only read it at night. Anyway, you can't read the system thing. You can barely read the nappy thing. Um, we'll see that there's lots of other cases where this uh, happens as well. Actually, it happens right here on the climate control screen. You have the off button on the right. Well, I mean, it's white on, well, essentially white. Um, you know, I can barely read it here in my dark garage. Outside, it's impossible to read that. Most of these controls work that way. Um, if I hit auto, well suddenly now auto is on, you can barely see that, it's white on white. It's even more white than the off was. Okay, so let's talk about auto for a second. The auto mode in this card basically doesn't work. Um, 
it says outside temperature. So my garage is 83 degrees right now. It's pretty warm. It's kind of warm in the car right now. I'm starting to sweat. Auto, I have it set to 69. There's barely any air coming out of here. Um, matter of fact, if you are out on the road and it's 90 degrees out and it's sunny and you're just being baked in here, it still barely blows in the air. It will not even come close to cooling the car down to 69. Auto mode doesn't work. It also doesn't work in the heater mode either. Same problem. You always have to go into manual mode. So um, this is your fan control. You got to crank it up, you know, and then you can set the, the temperature. And that's how you've got to cool things down. Now, I'm going to just put this down here. Now, one of the problems that this thing has is, you know, you're driving along. You go, oh, man, it's a little cold in here. I want to warm it up. So you tap it once. Now, in that case, it went from 67 to 68 degrees. But a lot of times, you do a tap. Well, that worked that time. Sometimes you'll do it, and it'll skip by 2 degrees. See if we can make it happen. No, it's working pretty well today. It's kind of random. There are times, however, where I've been at, say, 70 degrees, and I just want it 1 degree warmer, so I go to 71. And then all of a sudden, the thing just starts moving on its own, and it goes all the way up to 86. So I'm driving along. I go, okay, I just tap it 1 degree. Next thing you know, I'm like, why is it getting so warm in here? I look down, and the thing's set at 86. It, it, does, it just has a mind of its own sometimes, and it, it goes berserk. Um, you know, it's an interesting style that they did. And you've got your dual controls. You can turn dual on, at least supposedly here, and you know, you can set your independent controls. Um, it's odd that, you know, I hit dual. Unlike anything else, it doesn't indicate if it's on or off. I hit dual, the button doesn't change, but now I'm in dual mode. I turn dual off, the button looks exactly the same. There's no way to know if you're in dual mode. <sighs> so, that's the climate control system. You know, it actually works well when you're in manual mode. I mean, it does blow cold air and it does generate a fair amount of heat. It's a good system. Um, it's just that the interface here is, is not too hot. No pun intended. Okay, let's move on to the audio. All right, I'm gonna just go over some of the basic stuff here. So it's got, you know, your standard AM, FM, radio control preset stuff. Um, the good thing is it has three pages of presets. It goes up to 18. Well, there's a couple of bad things here. Problem number one is that it's another case of what were they thinking and how are people supposed to use this when actually driving the car in the real world. You've got these nice, you know, reasonably big buttons. They're easy to hit. You know, it's not a problem hitting them. But when the button is not activated, it's gray on black. You cannot read these radio stations during the day. Also, the font for the radio station is teeny. You've got this big button with this tiny little 93.3, 93.7. You, you can't read that. I mean, especially, I'm so far away from the screen here. Um, you know, it, you cannot tell what you're pressing. You just kind of have to guess. Now, another thing here is that when you change the volume on the steering wheel, it shows you here on the screen. It doesn't matter where you are. You know, say you're on the nav screen. You know, it shows you your volume. But, say I change the radio station, it doesn't tell you what radio station. Say I change source mode, I want to go to my MP3 player or something, nothing. It tells you absolutely nothing. I have no idea what, what audio mode I'm in. I don't know if I'm on radio, I don't know if I'm on radio station. You've got to go back to audio to see what you're doing. Oh, well apparently I was on Bluetooth mode. How are you going to know? It doesn't indicate it, it only indicates your volume, which is kind of dumb. So, all right, let's see. Uh, what else should I say about this? Oh, well, another problem is, so like I said, we have, um, you know, 18 radio presets, but I don't know of too many markets where there's actually 18 radio stations, um, at least 18 that you'd want to have programmed. So here in Austin, I am going up to eight. 103.5 is the last good station on the dial here in Austin. So the rest of them are blank, but they're not truly blank. They're actually all defaulted to 87.9. Well, those are actual tunable stations, 87.9. I and mean, if I go there and I, oops, and I crank the volume up, it's all static. So, you know, once again, say you're in the nav system, you're driving along and you want to change stations, suddenly it goes to static. Go forward again, static. Forward again, static. And now you're lost. You're like, oh my God, I'm all in the static zone. You got to start just pressing until you get back to a, you know, a normal, a normal uh, uh, station. So there really needs to be a way 
to clear out the unused station so that your steering wheel controls don't go there. It should just loop around the actual you know, uh, program stations. So that's a bit of an issue. Now it has satellite radio. I don't have any beefs with that. Uh, generally works. Uh, the USB, um, I should point out that prior, this was one of the reasons why I gave this thing an F minus. Um, the USB was unusable prior to the software uh, 615 update because if you plugged in your iPhone, and by the way, the, uh, there's a USB connector in here, um, you have to buy like a little $8 thing. I got this at, I don't know, Prize Electronics, I think, or somewhere, a little adapter for the iPhone, or you can get a little, you know, one of these uh, stretchable ones. Um, plug in your phone, and it used to actually crash the whole system. Horrible things would happen. So they fixed that. So now uh, the USB works, uh, the Bluetooth works. Um, the only problem, the Bluetooth gives you no information. It's a big blank screen. All you can do is just press play and forward and backward, and that's about it. Um, now, most of these screens, they also have this uh, uh, sound screen where you can set the, uh, the bass and the treble and the balance and all that, and, and it's all fine. It, it all does what it's supposed to do. Um, so let's talk about the phone for a second here. Okay, um, I actually like the phone screen. This is, you know, reasonably well done, but the main problem here is that this doesn't look anything like any of the other screens in the command center. It, it's kind of a consistency issue. I mean, whoops, I've got this, uh, it turns itself off after a few minutes. It's got this honeycomb texture thing going on, and you know, it looks nice, it's interesting, but why isn't this everywhere else? Why do these buttons look different, and why do all of these things basically work differently than everything else? Um, now, I want to point one thing out here because we're going to talk about something else in a second. Now, unfortunately, I don't think, well, it's, it's, here's another problem we have every now and then. It says address book download in progress. Um, sometimes uh, your address book simply never comes up. Um, it'll say download in progress for, you know, five hours and it'll never happen. And then you get in the car the next day and it's there. Um, but what I wanted to point out, and it's not going to work here because I have no address book um, loading, are the up and down arrows on this. This would be a list of your addresses. And these up and down arrows work as you would expect. You know, up scrolls up, down scrolls down. I know that seems like an obvious thing to say, but in a minute I'm going to show you why that's important to note. Okay, moving on. Um, let's go to the thing I want to show you. Okay, uh, let's go to system settings. Okay. Oh boy. Uh, I got to take a breath before I start talking about this because this, this is awful. This is awful beyond, I mean, this, this makes you wonder what two-year-old designed this system. Whenever I get friends in this car for the first time, I like to show them this screen because it's always fun to watch them squirm. I will ask them, how do you think I go to key fob, the key fob option? Well, the obvious first guess is to just hit key fob, right? Well, that does nothing. Door lock does nothing. Time region, none of those do anything. So like, okay, we can't press directly on it. That's really strange, but okay. And then they say, well, the obvious thing is to, I want to go down, press the down button. I said, press the down button, Pre press it again. Nothing happens. And now at this point, most people are stumped. They're like, well, you can't select it. You can't go down to it. What do you do? And usually by default, people get desperate and they press the up button. It makes no sense. Well, what do you know? The up button goes down to the next menu option. It's completely illogical. Additionally, because this list, all the lists for all these options start, you know, with the options going down and you're always pressing up. From the driver's point of view, when you are doing this, my entire arm is now blocking all of that. I cannot see what I'm doing. I mean, I have to literally go like this, or maybe even, no, that doesn't even work. You can't see what you're doing. It, it's asinine design. Anybody who had worked on this software for two seconds in a car would have realized this was not a good way to do it. And it's inconsistent that up goes down and down goes up, and that you can't even select options that are visible. Horrible. Okay, now, heh, another thing while we're here on this particular option. So this is an auto fold option. These are for the uh, side view mirrors. They fold in and you turn the car off so you know people walking by don't bump into them. Well, um, there's a bug in the software, and it's still in 615, the current software version, where uh, your motors will burn out, the, the motors that make the mirrors fold in. And so 
they have warned everybody to turn this off until we get it fixed because uh, sometimes the mirrors will fold in and the motors don't turn off and they just spin until they burn out. And that has happened on this car. Uh, I had to have both side view mirrors replaced due to burnout mirrors. Um, let me just go down to a different, I, I don't want to even try to even turn them on. Let me go to just a, another option here. All right, you have the settings on the right for this door lock uh, feature. What do you think is on and what do you think is off? Now standard user interface convention says that the highlighted option is the one that is currently selected. But what's highlighted here? I mean, here, the white on black is what is selected and it is what is highlighted. So you might say, okay, well, white on black must mean highlighted and selected, but it's not. It's actually backwards. It's the orange stuff means it's on, which is weird because usually orange or red indicates no. You know, that, that's kind of the universal color for off, but in the Karma, uh, it's the universal color for on. So it's inconsistent, it's, and I forget this all the time, you know, what is on and what is off, so sometimes I just have to just flip back and forth. I go, okay, I, I, I tapped it, so that means that the unhighlighted button, the one that is the same color as the background, but it has the orange text, which generally means off, that means on. Okay, so it's completely bass backwards. It's, it's just beyond retarded. I mean, it, I am a software programmer in the real world, and I've been doing this kind of programming, user interface touchscreen stuff, for a long time. As a matter of fact, and I'm not trying to brag, I'm just trying to make a point. This is an Apple Design Award trophy for a mobile application, an iPhone app that we did. Only a handful of people get these every year. We got one. That means I kind of know what I'm talking about when I talk about user interface. This is horrible. Let's move on to some of the options. Okay, we talked about the auto fold. Uh, there's just, uh, some of these don't really matter. Uh, let me, oops, sluggish, God. All right, let me just get to, uh, ah, come on thing. Um, okay, valet mode. Um, this is pretty cool. You know, it's basically, instead of having a valet key like you would have in most cars, you can enter a code and, uh, you know, it makes sure that they can't do anything crazy with your car. Uh, okay, let's talk about interior. All right, this screen is currently at maximum brightness. It's up to 10. And even at 10, it's really dim. I mean, I would say this is what your average, like, computer monitor looks like after you've been using it for about eight years, you know, and the, and the, uh, the cathode ray tube behind there is dimming and your screen's not as bright as it used to be. It's a pretty dim screen. However, at night, it's actually pretty bright. It's a big screen, and even, you know, kind of as dull as it is, um, that and the dashboard create a tremendous amount of glare, which drives me nuts. So, it's supposed to be able to automatically dim. I mean, there is a sensor right up there on the, uh, the, the windshield or underneath the windshield that can detect whether it's day or night out, but it doesn't work. This thing never dims at night. So during the day, you gotta crank it up to 10 so you can see anything, because anything less than 10, it's really impossible to see. And then at night, if you want to be able to see anything in front of you without being blinded, you got to come in here, manually turn it down to like four or five. Um, so I don't know why that doesn't work. Also, this parade button, the, the manual says nothing about what that does, so I had to Google it. Apparently, parade mode is supposed to force everything on. I don't know. It doesn't work. The point is I can tap it and nothing happens. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's see. Uh, it's got this thing called easy entry and exit. Well, what that does is that when you open the door to get out of the car or in the car, uh, the steering wheel you know, gets out of the way, the seat moves back. It's supposed to make it easier to get in and out. Um, I have to disable this because unfortunately, as the seat is moving back, what it'll do is it starts moving the seat like forward and it literally crushes your spine. Um, it's horrible. Uh, you feel like you're being sandwiched in a trash compactor with that option. Um, they need to make it so it doesn't move the seat forward. There's no reason for that. Um, okay, uh, let's move on to, okay, interface options, chime, on. As you've noticed, this thing makes absolutely no sound as you select things. Most, if not all, infotainment systems in cars have some sort of audio feedback as you press buttons so that you know that you hit them. 
no such thing in here. Instead, we have this thing called haptics. Now, uh, what haptic feedback is, is uh, basically a touch uh, thump. So when I press a button, I, the, the screen kind of moves. It makes a little thud. And that's cool, except that it doesn't work when you're moving. Uh, well, I should say it works, but you can't feel it. It's a very subtle effect. So even when I'm in the garage and the car's not moving, I can only barely feel that haptic feedback. When the car is moving and it's rumbling and you're moving around and all that, you can't feel it at all. So you're sitting here trying to press buttons, you know, it doesn't matter where you are, nav system, anywhere, and you just can't feel a thing. I mean, you have no idea if your touch was successful. You can't feel it. There's nothing, no audio cues, absolutely nothing. Um, this thing lacks user feedback. It's really annoying. All right, there's this memory audio presets. I don't know what those are. They're just blank buttons. They don't do anything. They never have, as far as I can remember. Um, nothing going on there. Um, okay. This right here is your memory seat. And there's, you know, you have two keys, so you can program two different settings for your seats, right? And this is useful if someone else is driving your car, like a valet, and then you get back into it and you want to move your seat back to where it was. Well, in most other cars, you know, there are buttons, and it's usually on the door or on the side or somewhere nearby. So, you, you know, valet gives you your key back, you get in the car, you press the button, your seat's done, you drive off. And this thing, when a valet gives you your car back, you got to boot it up, you got to navigate through all these menus, you got to get to this and then press it. And believe me, it takes forever to do that, even, even if you're experienced with it like I am. So, uh, that needs to be a physical button because it's a pain in the butt dealing with it. Um, uh, the rest of this stuff, uh, you know, I'm not going to really talk about uh, too much, uh, other than they have a trip computer uh, settings thing here, which is completely redundant uh, of the information that you get on another screen here and on the dashboard. Um, I don't know why this is here. I'm going to talk more about that in a second. Okay, let's go to the system diagnostic screen. Now, this is another case of it could have been so much better and they totally screwed it up. If there is a malfunction in your car, you'll get this thing will light up red and I think you get a warning on the dash and it'll take you here and it'll show you, you know, what the malfunction is, it'll light up. The problem is, is there's one for tires. So if you have a flat tire, it's gonna come in here and tell you which tire was flat. It's got the tire pressure monitoring system in this car. It knows what the PSI in all four tires are. It should show you the PSI in the diagnostics, but I can hit tires all I want. I don't even know what this circular thing in the middle is. It just doesn't do anything. There's no way to find out what your current tire pressure is, even though the computer knows it. It just doesn't want to show it to you. So it's kind of frustrating. Okay, the solar energy screen. I talked about this in the previous review. Uh, I'm sad to say that uh, software update 6.15 did not do anything for this. This is still just loading up a static screen, some JPEG or something doesn't do anything. There's supposed to be three buttons here that do things. I still have no idea how much solar energy I've been collecting because this does nothing. And this is inexcusable because this car has been out for half a year now. Why is this so difficult for them to get working? And by the way, because this isn't working, it means that the software in here, it's not beta and it's not alpha because the definition of alpha software is that it is feature complete and everything works at least once. That's the definition of alpha. Beta means, you know, you think it's done, you gotta send it to testers to prove you wrong. We're nowhere near that with this. They have placeholder art in. It is not feature complete and everything does not work once. This is still development software that they've put in a release car and it pisses me off quite frankly. There's no excuse for this stuff not working this long after this car came out. All right, the energy flow screen. Um, all right, this is actually a screen that I, I'm on a lot when I'm driving the car. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, it, it's, it kind of looks neat, but this is another case of, of a screen that really, really, really should be much, much better. Um, let's start with the big car image in the middle. Every uh, hybrid car that I've ever driven has something like this, right? It always shows you, you know, when you're hitting the brakes, it shows you the energy flow regenerating the battery and if you're using the gas thing. And it, you know, it just shows you the flow. In this car, it, it does kind of show you the flow, but it's very, it's very, very hard to tell what's going on. Um, it's actually to the point of, it's just useless. It really doesn't indicate any useful information. 
You know, for example, right now, I mean, it's animating the solar panel. You see it animating. But we're in the garage. It's dark. The solar panel's not doing anything right now, but you would think that it's actually charging the car. So, you know, that thing needs to be gone. They need to remove the car and they need to replace it with useful information. Because unfortunately, the only thing that it really gives you as far as a trip computer here is, well, your trip miles. So I've gone 844 miles since I last reset it. Uh, and over those 844 miles, I've actually done pretty well. I'm getting 188 MPG. That's awesome. But nowhere in this software does it give you anything useful like, well, okay, great, MPG is fine, but how about my miles per charge? I'd really like to know what kind of battery range I'm getting. But it won't tell you that. Um, I would love to have you know, a graph showing me my energy usage over time. I would love to have something like, you know, what's my instant energy? Well, it does kind of give you your instant energy use down here, but something a little more, um, you know, uh, miles related. Down here, it shows you your kilowatt usage, which actually is useful once you kind of get used to how things work. Um, uh, you know, it, you'll even notice, you know, like right now the car's not in drive mode, but when it is and everything's turned on, uh, you actually use one kilowatt just sitting in idle. And if the AC is on, uh, you're usually using about two kilowatts. If the heater's on, it's four to five, and so on. So it's interesting to watch, you know, as you turn on seat heaters and all these other things, how much energy that uses. Because if you're just going down the highway, you know, and you're just kind of maintaining a steady speed, you know, you might be using anywhere from, I don't know, 20 to 30 kilowatts. Um, so it's interesting to see how the AC can chew up quite a bit of your range uh, based on kilowatts. But it also shows you your uh, regeneration and all that. It's you know, this is, it's good information, but it needs to be better displayed and it needs to be displayed more in terms of numbers that people understand, you know, like miles, uh, and also maybe even a trip computer where you can enter, um, you know, how much does electricity, electricity cost where you are and ha have it tell you how much it's costing you per mile, just things like that. This should have an awesome trip computer and it has a really lame one. Okay, uh, let's see, let's go to, nav system. All right, the nav system is something that is really, really frustrating for me. Uh, okay, I am not even sure where to begin. Okay, let's start with this. Menu. You're driving along in the car, you want to set a destination. You have to reach over and hit menu. Now mind you, you have to hit that menu button dead in the middle. There is no margin of error for a hit zone around menu. You can't even get close to it. You've got to nail it right in the middle. And I can't tell you how many times I have hit the fold mirror button and I'm driving down the highway and all of a sudden my mirrors fold in because I accidentally hit that or I accidentally turn on the passenger's seat warmer. <sighs> all right, when you do get to menu, there's some good and there's some bad. The good is, hallelujah, they're finally using some gigantic icons that are easy to hit with your finger while you're moving in a car. The bad news is you can't read them. What the hell is this? It's white on white. I'm in a dark garage and I can barely read that that says enter address, change route, and route information. I mean, this is inexplicably awful. It's mind-boggling that anyone would have not caught this on version 1.0 four years ago and they started working on this piece of crap. And notice that this was illegible, especially in daylight. These are just white buttons. So you kind of have to memorize, you know, which button does what here. All right, enter address. Assuming you can remember which button does it, because God knows you can't see it. All right, now this thing also does have voice commands. Um, and I'm not going to do it here because it will just upset me. But <laughs> you, enter, you press the button, it'll say enter your city. Well. I don't really have much of an accent. I don't have a southern accent. I don't have a thick New York accent. I don't have any weird European accent. I speak clearly. But when I say Austin, every single time, she comes up, Boston, as in B-O-S-T-O-N. And I'll go, no, 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 cancel out, start it all over again. And I would say as clearly as possible, Austin. Not once have I gotten her to correctly accept Austin. She always brings up Boston, Texas, that's why it's on the uh, recent list here. So anyway, we're in Austin. So you would think you just hit Austin, that's where I'm gonna go. And by the way, you have to hit that dead in the middle too, and that's really hard to do when you're driving. Well, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're wondering what's going on, you go, oh, that's right, I can't just hit Austin. No, I gotta confirm it, so I gotta hit the check mark. And I wait, 
Ah, there we go. Enter street address. Okay, well, let's just say uh, Lamar. That's a, that's a pretty big street here. Lamar. Okay, North Lamar Boulevard. That's the road I want. Waiting. Oh, that's right. I have to confirm it again. Meanwhile, I probably hit the mirror button and my mirrors are folding in. Okay, now I got to enter the address. Here's the funny thing. It doesn't actually say enter the, the street number. It just says middle of the road and intersection. So this confuses me every time I go, oh yeah, yeah I got to know to do it. So I don't know, let's just say four, or, I don't know, let's just say 4,000. Say I want to go to 4,000 4, Lamar, okay? I had 4,000. Oh, that's right, I got to confirm again. This, while you're driving, is a death trap. I mean, this command center is like the poster child for distracting electronics in cars. You know, the idea is supposed to be that these are supposed to be efficient and they use the least number of touches and button clicks and the least number of times you have to take your eye off the road to get things done. But in the Fisker Karma, the command center makes sure that you have to press a button more times than is humanly ever needed. So I entered the address, now it's got it, and now what is going on? I gotta confirm it again. Another confirmation, good God. All right, now it's, you can see there's a graphics glitch here, this, this waiting icon that's bizarre, it takes forever to calculate. Okay, now, it came up with one route. Now sometimes it'll come up with multiple routes if there's multiple ways. It came up with one, you'd think it would just go. Nope, it doesn't, it came up with a route. I still have to confirm it again. God, oops. <laughs> okay, there we go. It's, uh, I think it's actually navigating. Now here's the funny thing. Normally when you would start this in a normal car, you would hear the nav lady come on and she would say, you know, turn left ahead or go half a mile or whatever. Well, believe it or not, she actually did do that, but we didn't hear her. And the reason is there's nowhere in the settings to set the nav lady's volume. The nav lady's volume is your radio volume, your stereo volume. And I have it on mute right now because I'm making this video. So when I have the radio on mute, she's on mute. Not only is she on mute, but my Bluetooth is on mute. So if I get a phone call right now, I'm not gonna know. Now, there have been a few times where I've had my phone in my pocket and I've felt it vibrate. And I go, oh, I got a phone, a phone call. So I press the phone button on the steering wheel to pick up the phone and I don't hear anything on the other end. I forget that the, uh, the, the, the volume is too low. It's, it's, it's muted out my caller. They can hear me just fine. So I'm sitting there going, hello, hello. And they must think I'm an idiot because they're talking back and I can't hear it. And at least a half a dozen times since I've owned this car, I've hung up on people thinking that I just had a, a dead call. I thought somebody called me and hung up because I didn't hear them. And then I would remember, oh, they were there. I just didn't have the volume up. So the nav lady does the same thing. And the problem is, is that in order to hear her, especially when the car's moving like at highway speeds, you gotta crank the radio pretty darn loud in order to understand what she's saying. So um, basically you end up using this thing without voice, con uh, voice command or voice control most of the time because uh, you can't hear it, you know, unless you wanted to get your ear eardrums blasted by the radio so that you can hear the lady. All right, so anyway, moving on. On the right here, it shows you, you know, your turn. So it's gonna warn you when there's a turn coming ahead. Well, the problem with this is that it doesn't warn you about turns until you're at the turn. You know, most nav systems, if you're on the highway, you know, when you've got a big split in the highway, say, you know, one split goes north somewhere and one split goes south, you know, it's gonna warn you way in advance, say, you know, such and such left lane or something. Well, this does that, but it'll do it when you're about 500 feet from the turn, um, you know, and if you're just driving down a road, it usually doesn't tell you to turn until you are literally have your front wheels at that intersection. So I, I've missed, I, I, miss, I shouldn't say I've missed uh, lots of turns, I've missed most of my turns when I'm using this nav system because, you know, it doesn't tell you or she, the lady doesn't come on and tell you until you're already there. You have to really watch the map and you really have to watch the uh, uh, the arrows and things here. Uh, another thing is that this this nav system appears to not have a compass. Uh, you know, in most cars now, you know, the the map will rotate uh, as soon as your car turns. Well, this thing only rotates based on your direction of motion. So, say you come up to a stop sign, you make a right hand turn, but you're going really slow, and the GPS hasn't quite updated your position yet. Well, the map still shows you aiming 
you know, the direction you were at the stop sign, even though you've turned, and it's very confusing uh, when you're trying to navigate through a neighborhood or something. Um, you have to move the car probably about 100 feet before it realizes you've moved far enough, and then it goes, oh, okay, we're, we're moving east now. Uh, so it, it re-rotates this. Why there's no compass, I don't know. Very frustrating. Okay, you press this button if you want to go to the bigger map view. Well, that's as big as it gets. I've never seen anything like this where you have this gigantic screen and you can't make the nav system go full screen. I, I don't understand that at all. I mean, that's crazy. Um, this is as big as it gets. This is also, this is not a very high resolution screen here. This is, a, it's 10 and a half inches, but it's pretty low res. Um, so now that we've shrunk it down to about, you know, two thirds of usable space, uh, you know, you can't see a lot of the street. Well, here, you know, we can see most of the street's names, but like if I try to pan around, uh, and when I'm not zoomed in all the way, which I am here, let me just zoom out a little. As you can see, even just out here, major roads. This is a major road here. It's off. This is a very major road. It doesn't tell you what, you know, what street you're on. And also half the time when you're driving, it doesn't tell you what street you're on. And sometimes when you're coming up on a turn, you know, it's telling you that there's a turn ahead. Sometimes it's kind of random. It doesn't tell you the name of the street that you're turning on. So, you know, you're waiting, you know, you see all these turns. You're not, it's hard to tell on the map which turn you're supposed to take. The, the nav lady's not giving any useful information. Um, so anyway, the nav system's terrible. I mean, I, I could rant on this forever, I think. Um, but let me let me just go into a couple other little things here. Um, okay, there's settings. Um, there's keyboard selection options. So the keyboard, as you may have seen earlier, it looked, it was laid out like a real keyboard, but it's not the QWERTY format. Um, it's just A through Z alphabetical, so actually entering your info is really confusing if you're used to just typing on a real keyboard. None of these settings will bring up a real keyboard. Um, they're all this funky thing. Um, also, uh, well, there's this POI thing. When you get the car, all the POIs are turned on, so you can't see anything on the map, and you have to go in here and manually turn them all off. Um, and I would also like to point out that here, the arrows are correct. Where up is up and down goes down. Remember how on the settings screen, up was down, down was up. So there's, you know, once again, a consistency problem. Um, also, there's no magic button just to get me out of this menu that I'm so deep into. You know, I just, I'm like, okay, I'm driving along. I don't want to screw with this. I just need to get back to the map. Quick, there's a turn coming up. What do I do? Oh, we got to press this. Oh my God, I hit the wrong thing. Oh my God, I just displayed all points of interest in this category. I'm screwed because there's no way to turn it off. Oh my God, there is. I can toggle it, but it doesn't indicate that. Oh my God, what did I just do? I mean, it's just, it's horrible. You, you hit the wrong button all the time. And look at it. Ah. It, it's so unresponsive and there's no audio cues to indicate whether it, it whether it took any of these, look at this, it's just, I don't know what it's doing. Just turn it off, turn it off, for God's sake. You know, okay, so I wanna go back. Meanwhile, I probably just missed my exit because I'm fidgeting with this. Oh, I guess I didn't hit it. Maybe I turned the seat warmer on, I'm not sure. Come on, thing, go back. Ah, God. Main menu, that'll get you back to the main menu, and then you gotta hit map. So, you know, it, it, the thing is a nightmare. It, it's really quite awful. Additionally, you may notice up here that there's no information indicating um, how far to my destination or when I'm going to get there. Well, I'm sorry, it does indicate when. Check this out. It says 539. Most people think that's the clock. Well, the clock is still this invisible thing in the uh, corner here. It's 438 p.m. Now, she thinks it's going to take me over an hour, well, an hour and one minute, to get to this location. Now, I know for a fact it only take about 20, 25 minutes tops to get there from here. But this is what happens all the time. The time estimates are always off. Apparently, the nav data must always think that every road you're on is 30 miles an hour or something. I'm not really sure. But in order to get useful information, you have to tap up there. There's no indication you should tap up there. But if you do, it says one hour, one minute, 14 miles. Once again, this information is kind of in the upper right corner. So during the day, you can't read this. There's glare on here. You will not be able to read any of that. It's useless. It's tiny font. doesn't matter. Um, I just... Uh, just awful. Okay, that in a nutshell, you know, is most of the problem with this thing. The only other thing that I, I think is maybe worth mentioning is the backup camera. So when you start up the car and you're going to back out of your garage or whatever, um, it has a backup camera. It is about the lowest quality backup camera I have ever seen in my life. 
Um, it's fuzzy, you can't see anything. The frame rate, the video is like really choppy. Sometimes it plays like a frame of video out of order, like, like, like it's almost going backwards. Um, really, really horrible quality video on the backup camera to the point of really being useless and paid a lot for that feature because the, the video camera is only part of the Eco Sport and Eco Chic models for this car. So that's the command center. It's garbage. Uh, they just need to completely trash this whole thing and start from scratch again because there really isn't much that I would say is salvageable here. Um, I mean, if they don't want to trash the whole thing, at least redo the color scheme, make the text legible, use a larger size font. It needs to be more responsive. There needs to be audio feedback in addition to the haptic feedback. Um, the voice command stuff needs to know Austin. Um, it, it doesn't, it shouldn't be asking me to confirm every single thing that I select in the nav system. You know, the list just goes on and on. It's an F, it's horrible, but like I say, overall, aside from this, the car is still a B plus.